Welcome back guys, Mike Burrows from Stanceworks here. We are working on the Ferrari once again, surprise, surprise. And today we're gonna to be pulling the shocks and springs off of the car. We're doing that because I wanna start with the planning and development phase of upgrading the suspension. I've partnered with H&R Springs for this build. They have been a huge supporter of mine since day one. They've made so many automotive dreams of mine come true, and this one is no exception. They have agreed to build a one-off, specially engineered setup to accomplish the goals that I'm setting out for. In order to pull that off, I've got to give them some basic information. We've got to pull parts off of this and, and kind of give them some measurements, motion ratios, things like that, and tell them what exactly we're trying to do. We won't have all of the information yet, but we can at least get that process started. They've got engineers in Germany and stateside that can do all of the hard work for me, but I've got to give them something to work with. So let's pull these parts off and see where we stand. So I want to show you guys how this thing comes out and give you an idea of what the suspension actually looks like. We're talking about a double A-arm, double wishbone system. And as is typical, the coilover runs from kind of the outside lower control arm up to the chassis. And in this case, it shares a bolt with the upper control arm. I don't know if you guys can see that all that well, but it, it pierces both of these at the same time, which Makes sense from a structure standpoint, I suppose, but mildly annoying to take apart. So we're gonna have to do that. But in all, we're trying to get this shock and spring assembly out of here. Let's see how much stuff has to come out in order to get it out. I'm starting with the upper mount on this spring and shock, which as referenced before, the bolt pierces both the upper eyelet and the upper control arm. It was a little bit tricky to get it out, but overall pretty simple and thankfully not seized at all. Everything on this car has clearly been serviced and taken care of, so nothing has been hard to really remove. I then moved to the lower bolt, which was just as simple to take out, although it does pass through the front sway bar mount, which was a little bit tricky. Last but not least, there's a third bolt that holds the bottom ball joint. I wasn't really expecting this to be part of the, the system or the way that it works, but honestly, it's kind of interesting to see in function. After pulling that, it's just a matter of pulling the upright up and out of the way, and the spring and shock dropped right out. I then turned back around and put the hardware back into place, so at least this stuff will stay together. The rear is much simpler to remove. We're only looking at two bolts. We've got one hiding back here, and then one at the top of the shock and spring assembly hanging out up there. So once we remove those two, this guy should come right on out. The rear was quite a bit easier to take apart, meaning it was very easy overall. All I had to do was tap the bottom bolt out after removing the hardware, and then up top, I kind of broke a rule and used a pry bar to hold one side of the nut, but it too came apart very quickly. I had to disconnect the rear sway bar and that allowed me to drop the entire assembly enough to pull the spring and shock combo out from the top. The whole process took only a couple minutes. I took video of the other side just so you could see the process again. And truth be told, I actually did this for the front as well, although I accidentally forgot to record one side of it. This side of the car came apart almost as easy as the passenger side, although the top bolt on the spring and shock was a bit tighter and proved to be a little bit trickier to get out. Once it was out though, it was just a matter of using that pry bar one more time and the entire assembly popped on out. Of course, then I did take the hardware and put everything back into place and got my lights out so they didn't stay and lose their battery. So all four corners are off the car. This is the factory Coney shock and spring combo. And truth be told, Ferrari did a pretty reasonably good job when specking these cars out. They changed the spring rates given the, uh, the different body changes for the car, whether it was a target top, a coupe, injected, carbureted, things like that. They really put in some effort in trying to develop the suspension to handle as best as it could for each individual model. But we're gonna need a lot more performance than this offers us. I also put this on the scale and it is surprisingly heavy. In the last episode, I talked about the potential weight savings when switching to coilovers and somebody online had mentioned they found 70 pounds between their brakes and their upgraded coilovers. And I was pretty skeptical at first. 
On the scale, that factory unit shows 15 pounds per corner, which on the surface sounds relatively light. This, on the other hand, is an H&R Motorsport coilover. It's a single adjustable unit, and this one is sprung and valved specifically for my Model A. I pulled it off just a minute ago. Now, obviously, this isn't what's going on the car, but it's a pretty good indication of what is. It's the same construction and same length as the factory Ferrari unit. Now, aside from giving us a lot better shock damping, valving, spring rate, all of that jazz, it's also going to drop a lot of weight because this unit is only four and a half pounds. So that means we're going to save about 10 pounds per corner, 40 pounds overall, a lot of which is unsprung weight. I'm really excited about that. That's going to make a huge difference in the dynamic of the car. So now let's take the camera over and I'm going to show you guys what's working underneath the car. I want to show you guys some of my thoughts while actually looking at the car. I think that'll be easier for me and for you guys too. Now, if you don't know what you're looking at here, this piece is called an upright and it's kind of the heart of the rear suspension. It has the hub, it will hold the brake. It's really what defines where your wheel and tire are gonna go. Attached to it are the control arms and this setup is called a double A arm suspension or double wishbone. The name comes from the fact that these look like wishbones or look like A's, they got really creative with it. Now, this type of suspension, this suspension layout, there are a handful of different ones. This one's tried and true. It has a lot of benefits that we'll have to cover in a different episode at some point, but the real benefit here is it offers a lot of adjustability, but simplicity when trying to define suspension geometry as a whole. You have things like camber, caster, toe, instant centers, roll centers. A lot of this is gonna be important as we engineer this car to handle the way we want it to, and having a double A-arm suspension is going to alleviate a lot of headache there. Now, if I run this through its up and down travel, you can get an idea of one of the benefits of this system. If you notice, the hub stays pretty much parallel with the chassis. There's a little bit of camber change, but not very much. That's beneficial because we don't want the alignment of the car to change very much under travel. You want a little bit of change and you want to be able to define that change but when it happens wildly with something like an old air-cooled Volkswagen swing axle, you wind up with a ton of camber. Or even something like an E30, if you lower that car too much, the trailing arms, another type of suspension design, wind up yielding a ton of suspension dynamic change under travel. And we don't want that. I'm pretty happy that we have a double A-arm here. Now, one thing that is going to change is the fact that if you didn't pick up on it, these fenders are not going to stay. I'm going wider with this car. With that means big tires, big wheels. And one of the things that I would like to change is the overall track width of the car. We're gonna get a lot of different benefits from that. But in order to do that, that means changing these control arms. I've thought about even changing the upright, converting it to something from a completely different car. I haven't decided if I'm gonna do that yet but I do think we're gonna come in and completely redesign these control arms and move this entire unit outwards. And we're gonna to have to do that before we get axles made or otherwise we're gonna wind up having to do axles two times. There's a handful of benefits that we're looking for. And the last of them is the fact that these control arms, if you can tell on camera, are like eighth inch plate steel. And in some, in some places it's doubled up up to a quarter inch thick of steel. These control arms are undoubtedly very, very heavy. I think we can probably save another 40, 50, maybe even more pounds by swapping all of these out for lighter components. So how does any of this matter when it comes to the coilover? Well, the coilover mounts to the upright here. There's a mount on the back side of it, and that's where the bottom of the coilover is picked up. And as we move this outwards, it's going to change the leverage that's on the coilover itself. This change in ratio is called a motion ratio. And we need to know what that's going to be or have a relatively close idea so that we can define how that coilover should be valved and sprung. Okay, so that's probably enough for a 101 on suspension, at least for one episode. But at least now you guys have a better understanding of what I'm thinking about and the changes that I'm thinking about making. There is a lot of stuff that's gotta happen before I'm ready to actually start making those changes. I'm gonna need fenders, I'm gonna need to know what tires I wanna run, what wheels, where I want everything to land, but at least now we have some basics. We can start heading in that direction. 
So let me know what you guys think about this kind of inside look and this information, because I'm always trying to evolve this channel and this content. I wanna know what you guys wanna see, what part of this process is most interesting to you guys. As always, I appreciate you watching and I appreciate the feedback, so thank you guys. And I'm already excited for the next episode. I've got my fingers crossed that next week, we're gonna start making some good progress on the engine if the rest of this week comes together the way I hope that it will. We'll have to see. In the meantime, keep watching, keep, keep on top of those old episodes, leave some feedback, and I'll catch you guys next week. Thank you, as always.